Hey, welcome to Worship Tutorials. I'm Bradford. Today, I'm gonna to be talking kind of like a personal story, but also it's gonna come with a little bit of a challenge and a perspective shift for you. Not too long ago, Brian did a video and he talked about how to play with people who are better than you. And it got me thinking and kind of in that similar train of thought, it made me think about something I could remember that helped me get better. And it's nothing earth shattering, but like I said, it's a perspective shift and uh, maybe something that a lot of you could be struggling with or a situation you all find yourself in right now. I know that uh, just being kind of like a freelance guitar player, I, I occasionally and quite often get asked to come fill in and to play. And that would be the issue of not having a deep bench of players or team members at your church, regardless of the role you are in. Um, that seems to be something common right now as we've come out of this kind of pandemic and like a lockdown and things sh shaping and shifting and changing. Uh, for some places, things are going really, really well and things are growing and we're seeing things happen exponentially at places. Some places we've seen people use that as an easy transition off the team, for better or for worse. And for some people, it has just been, I know for me, it was kind of hard uh, to keep up with the, and I use habit here in a good sense, the habit of attending church. Um, it made things difficult to kind of get back in the swing of things. You got used to not going for a while. And so I know that there are churches, ministries who are struggling with people, but that is exactly what I want to share with you all. That is the reason why I feel I improved tremendously as a musician, guitar player, worship leader, vocalist, just kind of everything that it encompassed. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background as to how uh, that happened and where I was at and um, kind of just give you a charge uh, if you can resonate with this. Currently, I reside in a part of Raleigh, North Carolina. My wife and I and our son, we just moved uh, not too long ago from across town. Um, I've been in this area of North Carolina since 2012. Before that, I was in Lynchburg, Virginia. I went to Liberty University for worship and music leadership and kind of did a focus on the Christian music industry, just kind of learning how to be an artist as well. I was really curious about that, how to you know, put on a show, and we're not talking about in a worship sense, we're talking about just like how to do music for entertainment purposes and how to do it in a way that is engaging and it's, you can't just rely on your talent, you need to be intentional. Anyways, lots lots of other things in there. But I was in Lynchburg, I was going to school. Um, for those of you who haven't heard this before, I actually interned with Fuller at the church he was at before he moved up to North Carolina. He was in Florida for a good bit. Came up here, we had communicated and kept in touch and as time went on, about a year and a half later, a girl that uh, I went to school with was actually at the church that Fuller was now the lead worship pastor at. And um, she told me, hey, this church I'm interning at needs a worship leader. And it kind of seems like your kind of place if you want to check it out. So I went online, checked it out, and lo and behold, there's Brian Fuller's picture on the website. So uh, 2012, I started at the church and I was the worship leader at a brand new campus in a small town called Sanford, North Carolina, which is about 45 minutes south of Durham, uh, 30 to 45 to 50 minutes, depending on where at, part, uh, south of Raleigh, that kind of area. Close to Fayetteville, North Carolina, if you're familiar. Anyways, if you haven't heard of it, it's kind of my point. It is a smaller town. I was brought on, my first Sunday was the first Sunday that that campus launched. And, you know, the years that I was at the church, no matter who was in charge or who, no matter who was the worship leader at that campus, um, finding people to be on the team. I'd beg and borrow. I'd have people from other campuses come down. I'd uh, have friends I met in town who played at other churches. And as long as I could get them on the schedule two months out, I typically could have more people. But case in point, we opened October 2012, December 2012, just a few months later, the first Christmas at the campus. My team for Christmas Eve services was myself on guitar and vocals, one girl on vocals, and one person on drums. That was it. We were trying to do Israel Houghton's version of Hark. There's measures of 13 and measures of seven all up in that piece, and there's loads of vocals, and two of us were trying to pull it off. I was determined to do it, and we did it, 
But now I would be like, there's no way that's a good idea. Well, I was stubborn. Whether or not that was a good idea, I'm not sure. But now I'd be like, that's just not gonna feel good. If I had that set up, not that they weren't great musicians and vocalists, not that that was the case. The case was the fact that it would just be weird to have that many tracks. But that first Christmas was not, it was not encouraging. I think back on that time as a single man living in a somebody's very generous, but still somebody's completed furnished basement around Christmas time. <sighs> Dark times. But I had no people. It was so hard. And the months leading up, that was only about two and a half months old as a campus, if that. Uh, the months that followed, we slowly started adding more people. But I didn't really have a like solid, consistent lead guitar player with me every week. And I was already interested in playing lead guitar, and I did do that from time to time. But it was because of this that vocally I got better, and as a guitar player I got better. I got better at tracks, I got better at building teams. That's not just something you're just you can just do, but it's not something that you're either born with or you're not. You can learn, you can figure out how to build teams. Honestly, it comes down to patience and relationships. That's the biggest thing. But being the guitar player that I was aspiring to be, I did not want to put lead guitar in the tracks. I tried to do as little as possible. Um, the other thing I didn't like doing was, this is around the time 10,000 Reasons was like a smash hit, right? It still is, but so good. But at the time, we did it almost every week. <laughs> I didn't like that mandolin in there, seemed too fake, too human. The piano intro, as beautiful as it is, is too human. And so I didn't want it to sound humanized. I was fine with like piano if it seemed like washed and reverb and it was more like a texture, it felt different. Um, and I didn't want to put certain things in the tracks. So I had to get better at lead and I had to get better at playing guitar and singing if I wanted to do different things. So that's what I wanted to share was this idea that when I was actually limited, I actually grew and got better in and saw growth in other areas. And uh, as much as like, as churchies as it sounds, Christianese as it sounds, I try not to do that, but still. Craig Rochelle has this formula. He does that often in his leadership podcast. And I really, it resonates with me. It's similar, the similar idea is similar, but when you have a problem to solve, or in my case, like I needed something to happen, right? I had limited resources, as in I had myself and I had a few team members, didn't have the team members that I was hoping for, right? And just short people. Uh, plus a willingness to fail. I was regularly fine with, at least by rehearsal, if something didn't work out at rehearsal, we'd, we'd drop it. I would try. Um, plus a crazy idea equals explosive innovation. And so kind of the idea there is when you have, you don't have a lot of resources, but you are willing to try things, good things can happen. And so for me, I was willing to try to get better at guitar and play lead, whether it was actually while singing a chorus or a verse, or it was only during the turns, whatever the case was, I was always going to give it a try. I did things like, sometimes I would record my own tracks so I'd be playing rhythm most of the time. And then if a solo came, I would basically record with the exact rig that I'd be using that Sunday, which at that time was like one guitar, one amp, and like the pedals I had on the board. Different story nowadays. <laughs> but I'd record the same thing. That way, when I went to play the solo or the lead part, the tone was consistent, and I would just make sure that that extra guitar part was buried a little bit. And that felt different to me, but it helped me with my production skills. It helped me get better with recording, because um, my goal was to uh, just get what I recorded to sound like what I was going to play live. And I would really just record right there in the church. I would just hit record on our tracks computer, and the whole thing was situated. It sounded exactly the same. So it helped me with that. And I record things. So it sounded more consistent and it sounded as weird and out of place. Like I didn't want the lead part uh, to like one thing remains, you know, that part, super cool. But I didn't want that playing while I was singing and clearly wasn't playing the lead part. We also did, we did a series about how we as Christians can change the world um, and how we are not just supposed to sit idly by on the sidelines. And so we did, man, probably largely because of me, we did Waiting on the World to Change. <laughs> Uh, and John Mayer solo has some harmonies. So I recorded the harmonies in the piano part uh, separately so they could be in the track because I wanted it to sound as much like that as I could possibly get. So I did stuff like that. I got really good at those kind of things. I had even before I had a timeline on my board, I used the looper in the song 
like the chorus before, whatever, if the progression was the same in another part of the song, I would loop it at that point. I'd record it at that point. And then when we got to the solo, I'd press play on it. So it would play the chords. Like I found different ways to make it sound bigger than we were. These aren't, you don't have to do these exact things. My point here is to shape your and change your perspective. If you find that you're lacking in something in your ministry and find if there is a way for you to learn something in that time. Um, some things you may have heard before are, you should only do the things only you can do and delegate other things. There are things whether you have a volunteer do it, you, uh, maybe you have a staff member who can help you with it, uh, maybe you have a volunteer who's pretty much a staff member, whatever. If there is somebody you can have help you take some things off your plate, do that. Um, and focus on something that you could see yourself getting better at and use this opportunity, this like season of, well, I don't have this, which very well could be a lack of band members because I know that all too well. I'm sure actually a lot of people this resonates with because at you know COVID, at the height of it, the beginning of all of this, a lot of people, myself included, took on new and additional roles uh, to make a live stream happen or to pre-record something. And so you had to get better at mixing or you not even get better at it. You just had to learn how to do something with mixing or edit videos or shoot videos or do graphics or whatever. Um, I know a lot of us have probably had that happen, but I wanted to showcase a personal story to kind of showcase the point in my life that I can look back on. And even though it was not my favorite season, because it was just, it was just weird. We, that's another story for another day. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't great either. Um, I just want to share a personal story to showcase a time where I feel like I honed in and utilized it to get better, to challenge you, uh, to encourage you maybe even, um, and just to kind of like, do what we try to do here is to help every church have excellence and authenticity in their worship. So take heart if you find that you are lacking in some way in your ministry. There's got to be something you can do in this moment to refocus that energy of worry and, and, and anxiety. I get that. I felt that. And I still feel that on the regular about certain things. But this has taught me to find ways to shift that, to change the perspective, to ask God, that's the greatest gift sometime that God can give us, just to ask God, God, what do you see in this moment that I don't see, that I can refocus, I can reshape, so that I can hone in on that and make the most of this? Sometimes that's not the case, but sometimes the greatest gift is perspective. So, hey, thanks for joining us. We will see you next time.